Let's take a look at our second method. Our second method utilizes perfect squares. So it utilizes some of that knowledge we already know. Like we already know how to take the square root of 49, it's a seven. We already know how to take the square root of four, it's a two. We already know how to take the square root of nine, it's a three. We already know how to take the square root of 25, it's a five, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to break the number into perfect squares because we already know how to do the square root of perfect squares, okay? So here's our list of perfect square numbers. We've seen it, all right? We've seen it before, uh, but 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, all right? And really, it's a good idea to start to try to recognize these numbers, okay? They come up a lot in math, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to find uh, perfect squares divide evenly into the radicand, and uh, this is probably a new word I haven't mentioned. The radicand is just the thing under the square root. Okay, that's the number in the square root, okay? So just uh, keep that in mind, it's this guy right here. It's the thing that's inside there, okay? Whatever that is, that's called the radicand. So we're just looking for perfect squares that divide into that, and then we're gonna take the square root of each perfect square. See, we, know, we already know how to take the square root. And it's really just like those fractions we just did, where we take the square root of each of those things individually, numerator, denominator. Once I break this number up, I can take the square root of each thing individually. For example, if I look at something like this guy, the square root of eight, I'm looking for perfect squares, numbers from this list that divide into eight. And hopefully as you look through this list, you see right away that eight is divisible by four, and four is right here on my list. See, four is a perfect square, okay? In other words, what we do is this. We say, hey, eight is four times two. But the thing is, we already know how to take the square root of uh, four. And so what we're doing is we're just taking the square root of each of these individually. Watch this, if I do the square root of four, and then separately do the square root of two. Well, we already know the square root of four is a two, right? But the square root of two, we can't really do. I just leave it the way it is, okay? I don't know what that one is off the top of my head, but now this is my answer. And here's how I usually display that. I usually just uh, put a circle around the thing I'm taking the square root of and say, hey, the square root of that is a two. I couldn't take the square root of the other thing, and that's it, okay? Either method is acceptable. This one, as you can see, requires a lot less work to be shown, but it's harder to think about, all right? The factor tree is easy in terms of the amount of thinking we have to do, but it requires more work, okay? This is less work, but requires more thinking, okay? Something like this guy, looking for perfect squares that divide evenly into 72. Again, when you look at this list, the first one you probably see is nine, okay? So like in this guy, I would say, hey, the square root of this guy, that's 9 times 8. But then you got to keep going. Look for more perfect squares, like here. 8, we just did that one. That was 4 times 2. And see, now I know the square root of 9. The square root of 9 is a 3. So I put it on the outside. The square root of 4 is a 2. I put it on the outside. And this guy that's left just stays on the inside. So that's going to be a 6 root 2, okay? And here's the interesting thing about this. There is a larger perfect square that divides evenly into 72. And so if you're using this method, it benefits you to find the biggest perfect square. That's actually 36 times 2. And now watch this. The square root of 36 is a 6. Isn't that what I have on the outside? And then the 2 is still trapped, and that's what I have on the inside. Okay, so again, you're just looking for things that you already know how to take the square root of that you can take out of this uh, square root, okay? This one, the perfect square that divides evenly into 128, the biggest one, and really you'd probably arrive there by guess and check anyway, is a 64, 2 times 64. 64 is on our list. Well, what is the square root of 64? The square root of 64 is an 8, and that two is still trapped. And it goes back to that factor tree I did on the previous page. These are the same examples from the previous page. I don't know if you've noticed yet, okay? But when we did that factor tree, we saw that pair of eights, and I said, hey, couldn't we stop there and just take the pair of eights? That's the same thing as taking the square root of 64, okay? Because eight times eight is eight squared. The square and the square root cancel out. It's like taking the square root of 64, okay? So the factor tree is having the same effect, but it's showing it more literally, okay? If I look at this guy, again, perfect square that divides evenly into 75. The biggest one I can think of is a 25. This is 25 times 3. And now right here, the square root of 25 
is a 5. So I had a 4 out here, now I have a 5 out here as well from the square root. And now the 3 is the only thing I can't take the square root of. So now let's see, that's a 20 square root of 3. Okay, so I'm just looking for perfect squares that divide evenly into this thing. All right. And then once again, if I look at this guy, and then looking for perfect squares to divide evenly into this, it might be tough. You might need to use a calculator and do a little bit of guess and check on this thing. I believe the, the biggest one on this one is 16, okay? Uh, 16 times 6, all right? And now the square root of 16? Well, I know the square root of 16. The square root of 16 is a 4, but I can't do the square root of 6, so I just leave it as the square root of 6. Okay, I'm taking the square root of each of those individually. If I look at the next one, again, a perfect square that divides evenly into 24, I think the only one is 4. It's 4 times 6. And I know the square root of 4, so the square root of 4 is a 2. So it's going to join this guy on the outside. But I can't take the square root of 6, so I just leave it as the square root of 6. I'm taking the square root of each of those individually. The square root of 4 gave me the 2. The square root of 6 stays as the square root of 6. Okay? And then, of course, yeah, I can simplify this a little bit. That's a 6 root 6. Okay? This guy, same kind of thing as what happened on the front. I'm going to do the square root of each of these individually. All right? So on this one, I'm going to do the square root of 32 and the square root of, five separ or the square root of 25 separately. Uh, uh, 32, the biggest perfect square that divides in there is 16. And now I know the square root of 16. The square root of 16 is a 4. But the square root of 2 is just the square root of 2. All right? Here, this one's already a perfect square. The square root of 25, I already know that one. That's 5. And so this fraction becomes 4 root 2 over 5. I'm just taking the square root of each of those numbers individually. All right? So I need numbers that I already know how to take the square root of. And then those last one, same kind of thing. Here's the square root of 12, and then I'll do the square root of 81. Again, the square root of 81, you already know how to do. That's a 9. The square root of 12, well, there's a 4 in there. It's 4 times 3, and you know how to do the square root of 4. What's the square root of 4? The square root of 4 is a 2. And now I do also do the square root of the 3, which I can't simplify at all. And so that's it. It becomes 2 root 3 over 9. Okay, so when we're simplifying these things, we can either do our factor tree, the prime factorization, all right, and we look for pairs. Every time we find a pair, it goes to the outside. Anything that doesn't have a pair stays on the inside, all right? When we're doing the perfect square method, we just look for perfect squares that divide into the thing, and then I take the square root of each perfect square. So once I have it split up, I'm taking the square root of each thing under the root, and it just so happens I know how to take the square root of the sum of those things. So I write down those answers, and then whatever's left under the radical is just stays as a square root. Okay? Hi there, folks. Today we're looking at dividing rational expressions. And really, dividing rational expressions comes down to this thing called rationalizing the denominator. Uh, the idea is that we don't want radicals in the denominator, whether it's a square root or a cube root or a fourth root or a fifth root. We don't want that in the bottom of a fraction. Okay? The numerator, that's fine. We can have uh, radicals in the numerator all we want, but we don't want to have any radicals in the denominator. All right? And so when we're dividing rational expressions, essentially our goal is to eliminate all radicals from the denominator. All right? So when dividing radical terms, we want to rationalize the denominator. And again, rationalize the denominator simply means eliminating all the radical terms from the denominator. Okay? And really, this is kind of like getting common denominators when we uh, really get into this. We are essentially looking at this and saying, I have a denominator that I don't want. I would prefer to have this denominator. How do I get that? Okay? Like if you had a fraction of 1 half, you would prefer a denominator of 4, so you multiply by 2 over 2. It's going to be that same kind of concept, but instead of trying to get a specific number, we're just trying to get something that doesn't have a radical. Okay? The first thing you always want to do, though, is you want to simplify this thing uh, just as it's written first to see if maybe the denominator rationalizes itself, okay? Always simplify the radical before you start to force rationalize this thing, okay? Before you start multiplying by anything or doing any of that kind of stuff, just simply simplify first to see what you're actually dealing with. And that'll have two effects. One, 
we might actually get rid of the uh, radical in the denominator just by simplifying, but two, it might make rationalize the denominator and what we have to multiply by a little bit easier and a little bit smaller, okay? So always simplify first. For example, if I look at this guy, just like uh, our rules for multiplication, remember multiplication and division are technically the same thing, so we can apply the same rules. Remember with multiplying, it was outside times outside, inside times inside. So with division, it's the same kind of thing. Outside divided by outside, inside divided by inside. So the numbers on the outside here are just ones. Okay, so it's just one divided by one, which is one on the outside. But now I can divide the things that are inside the radical. I could say, hey, 63 divided by seven is a nine. And again, that stays on the inside of this thing. X to the fifth divided by X to the first. Remember, there's a little one here. If you've forgotten that, remember when we divide, we subtract the exponents. And then here, y to the seventh divided by y to the third is y to the fourth. Okay? And so what happens is, I don't even have a denominator anymore. Because I simplified a little bit, the denominator went away. Now I could start taking the square root. The square root of 9 is a 3. The square root of x to the fourth is x to the second. The square root of y to the fourth is y to the second. There's nothing left under the radical. So this one is rationalized just by simplifying the denominator went away completely, okay? And there were no radicals left in the denominator. So always try to simplify first, okay? If I look at the next one, this is the same situation, except instead of having it written as two square roots, it's written as the fraction under one square root. That means the same thing. So I can start by just doing some division and simplifying this guy a little bit. Let me write it over here first. So if I do this, 8 over 32 reduces to a 1 over 4. And then that's going to be an x to the 6th. Again, if you forgot, we're subtracting the exponents. And then y to the 3rd. And now I continue to take the square root. And really, I just take the square root of numerator and denominator individually. So if I take the square root of x to the 6th, that's an x to the 3rd. If I take the square root of y to the 3rd, that's a y to the 1st with 1 left over. And then the denominator, again, I just take these separately. The square root of 4 is a 2. And that's it. And so even though I still have a radical here after simplifying, I don't have a radical in the denominator. Okay. And if you need to see this broken down, I'm just doing the square root of the numerator over the square root of the denominator. When I take the square root of a whole fraction, I just take the square root of each of those individually. Okay. And as I simplified, what happened is I no longer have a radical in the denominator, and that's the goal. It's okay that there's a radical in the numerator, but I don't want a radical in the denominator. Okay. If I look at this one, this one, there's nothing that I can simplify here. I might try to simplify first, but in this one, it, there's nothing that I can do. Okay. I can't simplify this in any way, shape, or form, so what I want to do now is rationalize the denominator. I essentially want to use the same techniques for getting common denominators, I don't want a denominator of the square root of 5. I want a denominator that's anything other than a square root of something. Okay? And so really I just have to ask myself, what do I need to multiply this guy by? You know, when I dealt with fractions before, like, you know, 1 over 2, and I wanted a denominator of 4, I would look at that 2 and say, okay, how can I turn that into what I want it to be? How can I turn that 2 into a 4? And I do that by multiplying by 2 over 2. Okay? And so I asked myself the same kind of question here. What can I turn that square root of 5 into, and how do I turn it into that thing? Okay. And so when you think about it, the square root would go away if I had a perfect square underneath there. Instead of a 5, if that thing was like a 4, then I could take the square root of 4 and get a 2. If that thing was a 9, I could take the square root of 9 and get a 3. Okay. And so a 4 and a 9 will... That's not going to be easy. It's not easy to turn a 5 into a, a 4. It's not easy to turn a 5 into a 9. So think about a perfect square that's easy to turn that 5 into, and hopefully you come up with an answer of 25. I can turn that 5 into 25, so I want to multiply that 5 by 5. But here's the mistake students make. So don't write this down. But they go like this. They say, oh, let me multiply by 5 over 5. Well, think about your rules here. This denominator would become 5 square root of 5. See, it's outside times outside, inside times inside. I want to multiply that inside number by 5, so what I really need to multiply by is the square root of 5. Okay? And there's kind of two ways to think of that. You could think of it as saying, hey, I want to get a perfect square under the radical, so I need to do inside times inside. Or you can think of it this way. When you think about a square root, 
It's the opposite of squaring something. And squaring something is really multiplying it by itself. So if I take the square root of five times itself, I'm squaring the thing. I'm undoing the process of the square root, which is what causes it to cancel. So watch this. If I multiply this out, that's going to be two root five, outside times outside, inside times inside, over here inside times inside is the square root of 25. And now I continue to simplify. The square root of 25 is just a five. And now the denominator has been rationalized. And the, the two over root five, that is equivalent if we were to plug that into the calculator, as the, that would be equivalent to the 2 root 5 over 5, okay? But the difference is I no longer have a radical in the denominator, okay? And I can't simplify those 5s because 1's on the inside and 1's on the outside. Remember, applying that same rule that we had for multiplication, outside divided by outside, inside divided by inside, that's the answer for this one. We've rationalized the denominator, okay? This one is the same kind of thing. Again, you could break this up and say, hey, that's like the square root of 10 over the square root of 3. That means the same thing. When you have the square root of a whole fraction, it's the square root of each piece individually. Okay? And so now from here, if I want to turn that 3 into a perfect square, the easiest perfect square to turn it into is a 9. So I'm going to multiply by square root of 3 over the square root of 3. And it's that, that idea of we still have to do the same thing to the numerator and denominator. Okay? And so what I end up with here, I end up with the square root of 30 over the square root of 9, which is the square root of 30 over 3. And once again, I cannot divide the 30 and the 3 because one of them is inside a radical and one is outside a radical. Okay, We have to keep those uh, things separated. Okay, And that's it. The denominator is rationalized. And mathematically, the, the, what I started with and what I ended with are equivalent if I plug them into the calculator. But one has a radical in the denominator and the other one doesn't. Okay?